Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to the 98th live program on orthopedic principles. We are once again back with Dr. Ajita Puhami from Sri Lanka, who is uh, with the fourth program with us. And today he's going to talk on diabetic foot with respect to the FRC's exam. Over to you, Ajit. Thank you very much, Hitesh. Good evening, everybody. So today I will talk about diabetic foot. This topic is very important and I would call it as a hot topic because it, it's very common in MCQ paper. It's quite common. A lot of MCQs coming from this diabetic food. Plus, you can get in the viva table, especially in the basic principles viva plus, adult pathology viva, there's a possibility to get diabetic food management. So you need to know about two main things in diabetic food you have to know. One thing is the diabetic ulcer, other one is the diabetic deformed food. Those are the two uh, areas you need to know about diabetic as an orthopedic uh, surgeon, as a FRCS candidate. Okay, we'll go gradually uh, throughout these two uh, areas we'll discuss. If you touch the epidemiology part first, it's nearly 12% of diabetics have foot ulcers. Foot ulcers are very responsible for this. It's, it's responsible for the 85% or lower extremity amputation. That is the thing. It is it becomes a very hot topic. If you don't do the ulcer management, if you don't know the proper ulcer management plan and assessment of the diabetic food, then uh, it, it would be a problem as orthopedic surgeon. So that part would be assessed in your exam. So 100% of 100 amputations per week in United Kingdom could be purely due to diabetes. So it is very, uh, uh, significant uh, disease and problem in the uh, patients, patient populations and in uh, uh, orthopedic. So when you talk, uh, we'll talk about ulcers first. This ulcer can be three types uh, under diabetics. One third could be neuropathic ulcers, one third ischemic ulcers due to macro and micro ischemia and one third is mixed, both types. In addition to that, I need to mention here, mechanical ulcer also is possible under diabetic foot because it's diabetic foot, usually they don't have normal foot architecture because a lot of bony prominence and there are uh, high chance of getting mechanical or traumas related to diabetic foot. Uh, uh, than normal food. So mechanical ulcers are quite common, but mainly we need to talk in the first exam, neuropathic ulcers and the skin ulcers under diabetic food. So we need to know about neuropathic ulcers basically because it's usually get the symmetrical distal polyneuropathic uh, distribution. So it affects for all three neural elements, autonomy, Sensory and motor. How is autonomic is do a major role here because once it affects the autonomic nervous system, dysfunctions of the autonomic system that reduce sweating mechanism of the skin. The sweating mechanism is quite important to keep the skin wet. But there's no sweating skin become dry, there's a high chance, and this leads to fissuring of the skin. This fissure can lead to us. Then it will reduce the local vascular response to an injury because it's very important for wound healing process. If you know the steps of wound healing, that local neurovascularization and vasodilatation and do the nutrient supply to the uh, at the site of injury to wound healing is quite vital. So if affect the local vascular response by affecting this autonomic system, that will impair the fissure healing system, and this it can lead to an ulcer. And uh, alters uh, nail growth as well. Then come to the sensory system, which affects the sensory it affects the protective system, involved in the pinprick, light touch, vibration, and the proprioception. It usually gives a stocking distribution. And at last, the motor involvement, 
it mainly affects to the uh, it leads to uh, by involving the motor system it leads to deform deformity formations of the food so it 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 leads to atrophy of the intrinsic muscles due to atrophy of the intrinsic that leads to various deformity and imbalance between the intrinsic and extrinsic system and imbalance between the extrinsic and flexors they develop cables uh, and the falling force and especially tibialis anterior weakness as extrinsic weakness it leads to equinus contraction because tibialis anterior and the achilles tendon it has equilibrium force are in the equilibrium state one this dorsiflexion defect is impaired by weakness of the tibialis anterior it's going to plantar flex and we develop equinus contraction so that proceeding for the metatarsal head to pull forward and that reduce cushioning and the, that increase the shearing force over the metatarsal head can lead to alpha formation you need to know that uh, to discuss the pathophysiology dividing this autonomous sensory and motor because it is is possible it's a very common bifurcation in your basic principle table then this is this is the part i will straight away go for because the uh, assessment part because assessment is the part is area would be question uh, from you in your exam if you don't know the proper assessment and if you don't know to cover up all uh, areas then you might lose a lot of marks so you start your assessment start with the, it's a multidisciplinary team approach that is the buzzword unit law and then you have to talk about as a first step is a diabetic control because diabetic is a main uh, initiative causative factor for this ulcers or deformed formation deformed food so if you control diabetic you have to assess the patient what type of diabetic patient has because sometimes the type 1 could be type 2 diabetic is possible if it is a type 2 diabetic the treatment would be different so type 1 diabetic is treatment different so sometimes it's a deformed food presentation is type 1 is quite earlier compared to type 2 that kind of little bit variation is there so it's important knowing the type of diabetic and the duration and the severity of the disease and what are the medication patient has been taken so far and the patient's diabetic control by doing the hemoglobin a1c level because it shows a sugar level control over preceding 3 months so it's very important to do the initial assessment in the diabetic control then we do the assessment for the neuropathy part we'll do the neuro neuropathic vascular and the deformity assessment is very important likewise you divide when you ask the patient okay how do you assess this patient you start with the multidisciplinary team approach then talk about the diabetic control as the initial step then divide into three uh, levels neuropathic as neurology assessment vascular assessment and the deformed assessment deformed comes to the risk assessment so neuropathic assessment start with the history that you can ask the history whether the patient has some numbness of the source and the patient complain typical uh, that commonly patient come to they feel like they are walking on cotton then sometimes they feel like they are dropping their frequent they drop their uh, shoe wears which are not dry so that kind of a, a typical history patient produce when they say we call in uh, diabetic neuropathy In the assessment wise is the examination i will do the same swells and monofilament test you need to tell about that it is very important because it that shows a, that's a risk assessment for the ulceration so we use a 10 gram nylon monofilament we do the test another thing is is possible they will give a picture okay draw the shoulder and tell me what are the areas they show me that you can put the cross over the sole and show what are the areas you do assess to assess your clinical knowledge whether you have done the monofilament test in your at any point in your life so that sort of assessment can happen in your exam by your table so you need to know there are nine areas in the soul you do the assessment that clearly mentioned in this picture so we do this uh, monofilament assessment if it is present so we are, we can be happy that patient has preserved this protective sensation if it is absent no protective sensation then we can do the vibration with the tunic fork keeping 129 or bony prominence because that's a predictor of early neuropathy that is the mcq because rather than sensing the vibrations is the early neuropathy sign and at last we can do no conduction study then vascular assessment vascular we can do the, the we can look at that you can see the shiny skin and hair loss and we can do the capillary refilling time we can see the pul uh, palpable pulse 
and ankle brachial pressure index. That is the keyword we have to talk in the diabetic code in the vascular assessment. We have to assess the systolic pressure in the ankle and brachial. It's normal is one, it's 0.8 to 1.2. If it is less than one, we have to think about it. It's a peripheral neuro. Uh, that is, uh, uh, peri sorry, it's a, a fringe administer, it's a, per a peripheral vascular disease. And it's less than 0.45, it should be critical ischemia. So you need to get the urgent surgical intervention. And if it is more than 1.3, that could be the calcification or Monkeberg sclerosis. That is MCP in your FRC system. Another uh, method is a transcutaneous oxygen saturation. That is highly correlated with the wound healing, wound breakdown. So it's a gold standard assessment of the wound healing potential. That is MCQ. Transcutaneous oxygen uh, saturation is MCQ to assess the wound healing potential. And it is normal 40% is less than 25 is the high risk of wound dehiscence. And we can through the handheld Doppler that to assess the triphasic signal and the angiography. Angiographic assessment. Then deformity assessment, we need to see the ask the patient to walk and do assess the ligament assessment, which is stable, unstable, which is a painful or painless and the functional loss. And we do the uh, hind foot assessment, mean foot, and the forefoot. In forefoot, we look for the chlorine toes and we look for the source for, uh, sore for the plantar callosities, plantar ulceration. Another important thing is we have to do the silver skull test to see the equinus contraction. Because I showed you before, uh, I explained you uh, earlier in uh, modern involvement due to weakness of the tibialis anterior, there's a high possibility to get in equinus contraction that will develop. Uh, so we can assess that with the silver skull test. And finally, we can see the charcoal food. So charcoal food is a basic deformed food. We can see the loss, collapsing of the medial arc, rocker bottom food, and it's not the normal food architecture. There is no curvatures. So we can see multiple bone prominence and some uh, deformed and crooked uh, shaped food. So it's basically uh, charcoal food. I will discuss that with later, so I will go, this is the alpha assessment part. So in the assessment, we do the neuropathic, vascular, and the mechanical, and duration of the ulcer we assess, and we have to assess with the previous ulcer history, treatment, and we do the blood investigation. So it's very important to see the infective or not. In the full blood count, ESR and CRP. And X-ray, we have to see the osteomyelitis features and associated deformity, subluxation, and the joint dislocation. And if you need to exclude osteomyelitis, we can go for a bony scan, WBC label scan, or we can do the MRI scan through the plus collection, so osteomyelitis features, early features we can see, and we can do the staging system for the ulcer for the Wagner staging system. You need to know the Wagner staging system in your exam. But when you talk about the NICE guideline, I will tell you later, in the NICE guideline, the basically they will not give uh, attention for this Wagner staging system. They talk about screen blank classification. Your, you need to know about, but I would advise you to go ahead knowing this Wagner staging system because uh, they commonly ask about that, but when it, in case they ask, something about nice guideline for the diabetes food and ulcer management, then you have to talk about thin band classification. I will mention them in my future slide. So Wagner classification, it starts with grade zero. So there is no ulcer that skin at rest over the bony prominence. So we have to get all preventive measures here. And when it comes to the grade one, it's only localized superficial ulcer is not infected. We can go for antibiotic management with the glycine control. Type two is a deep ulcer. It can extend up to the bone, ligaments, tendon could be exposed. We have to go for a debridement and culture, antibiotics and glycemic control. And uh, type two is a deep abscess with or uh, associated with osteomyelitis. So it has extensive debridement and sometimes we have to go for amputation. In type four is a four foot gangrene. So 
for foot gangrene, so wide debridement, sometimes partial amputation, and type five is gangrene. We have to go for baloney amputation. So if type three, I need to mention the deep abscess. Type three, if we can probe up into up to the bone. So if it is probe up uh, to the bone, it's about sixty-seven percent chance having osteomyelitis. That could be an MCQ in your exam because stage three, high chance of osteomyelitis because we can probe up to the bone. If we can probe, mean there's a 67% chance to chance having diabetes plus also plus osteomyelitis for that particular patient. <clears throat> what are the risk factors for ulceration? So. Dry skin, as I told you before, dry skin leads to fissure information and microtraumas with loss of protective sensation and autonomous vascular ischemia because no vascular response, so it's a less chance of wound healing and deformities produce more pressurized areas, especially in the metatarsal head and the plantar midfoot area, so they get mechanical ulcers and uh, uh, ulceration formation. So neuropathic and ischemic ulcer differences, you need to know a tiny bit, so I will not go into that detail. Usually ischemic ulcers are quite painful, uh, while these neuropathic ulcers are painless. Neuropathic ulcers, so we can see at the base of the metatarsal. I'll show you a picture here, this first picture, it's, it's, it's a neuropathic ulcer at the base of metatarsal head. But ischemic ulcers could be anywhere in the leg. So and neuropathic ulcers are quite punch out lesion. And this base of the ulcers of the neuropathy, because their vascular system is quite intact, so we can see the very healthy granulation tissues and the high chance of bleeding on palpa uh, touch. But in ischemic ulcers, a very ill looking, very fibrotic base and poor granulation tissues, and it doesn't bleed easily. And neuropathic ulcers, we can see the hyperkeratosis around. I'll show you the picture again that we can see the thick hyperkeratosis around the ulcer, but in the vascular ulcers, ischemic ulcers, we can't see much of uh, uh, hyperkeratosis around the ulcer. And uh, ischemic ulcers, we can see shiny and hair loss and especially ankle brachial pressure index is less than eight in the ischemic ulcers. And other side, we do the monofilament test to assess the protective sensation. That's all differences you need to know between neuropathic and ischemic ulcers. <clears throat> in management wise, start with the multidisciplinary approach, sugar control, then Whatever the stage, we have to start with the preventive is better than cure. So we have to start with the preventive measures because in preventive measures play a big role in this foot care in the NICE guideline. Because they have separate local protocol to the preventive mechanism. So we need to talk about the prevention initially. Then patient education about the disease, what are the preventive measures, about the deformities and what are the risk factors on how you can avoid and what are the safe footwear, everything we need to educate the patient and then accommodate your footwear with padding to in increased risk, high risk areas. When you talk about the multiple, uh, multidisciplinary approach, it's a huge lot of people should include. Start with the endocrinologist, then podiatrist, then diabetic special nurse, Vascular surgeon, if it's a vascular problem, it's a vascular ulcer, we need to get involved with the vascular surgeon to correct the vascular supply. If there's a uh, peripheral vascular disease, we have to go for a bypass or we have to go for angiopass, TO. Uh, so we have to get involved the vascular surgeon. And orthopedic surgeons, if there's a deformed formation, so we have to go for a surgery, then you have to involve. And microbiology is very important in the ulcer management. If it's infected, we have to go for a biopsy and do the treatment according to antibiotic and it, microbiologist plays a very significant role in this multidisciplinary approach. And plus uh, interventional radiologists, orthotic cast, foot pairs, I will talk in details in later in future my slides. 
and occupational therapy, sometimes a plastic surgeon in the vascular treatment. We have to go for a negative pressure uh, treatment for this. So there are so many involvement. We have to, uh, we have to do the proper rehabilitation. Sometimes we have to go address the psychologist because psychological patients were very affected because they, they cannot perform his normal activities. They can't walk with these ulcers. They are confined to the uh, home. So we had to treat their mental status, mental uh, backgrounds as well, and nutritional care. So likewise, this is, is a plethora of list is there to come on the multidisciplinary team. So as the management, when you come to the management, these ulcers we can divide is the neuropathic and ischemic ulcers. And here, very important is where they divide the uninfected, non infected, and infected ulcers. If it's a non infected ulcer, so we can go for total contact cast. At the initial state, we had to go for a total contact cast. That's to cut off uh, to areas uh, to offload the ulcer. The main Target is the offload the ulcer by total contact cost. And we have to do some mechanic, some uh, correct mechanical deformity sometimes. Now imagine the patient has the equinus contraction. So patients having a plantar, food, uh, plantar flexion and there is this metaca metacarpal, uh, this head of the metatarsal ulceration. So if we can correct the equinus deformity, we can reduce the pressurization over this metatarsal head. So we can do that concurrent surgeries we can do and the ulcer care, dressing, and uh, antibiotic management uh, uh, we can do. Then if it is a vascular ulcer, we have to get in all the vascular surgeon and do, do angioplasty or bypass surgery and then do for, as I discussed before, total contact cost for the ulcer management. If it is an infected ulcer, so as, as I said before, if it can probe up to the base, it's a 67% of ulcer that probe into having osteomyelitis. So we have to use the step ladder approach for the starting with the antibiotics, so sometimes it might go into amputation. So adequate wound debridement is very important and we have to send the samples, soft tissues and the bony sample, deep cultures and do the microbiologist opinion, culture, BSP and start antibiotic appropriately and the ulcer dressing and the, we can use the dressing to absorb exudate and we can do the very tight dressing to get, uh, keep it as a barrier to get new uh, pathogen to get into the body and we can use a negative pressure if it is uh, pressure dressing and offload the ulcer by total contact cost. I will talk a little bit about total contact cost here because it is very uh, gold standard mechanical relief for the plantar ulceration to offload the foot and ankle while the patient being active. Usually it's necessary to continue it up to four months because it's uh, it's very important. Uh, we can continue this, the initial stage, we have to continue up to the temperature, swelling and erythema reach to normal level. Because it's the main, it's the evidence says the temperature is the best denominator to reduce recurrences. So if you do not continue at least four months until that all parameters, temperature, swelling, erythema come to normal level, total contact cost, there's a high chance of recurrence. That's why it starts with adequate immobilization with the total contact cost, then followed by we can go the talk or free strain orthotic broker, then custom shoes. The short immobilizers is the increased recurrence. So this is a, say a total contact cost. We can, uh, we can change the cost every week. We can assess during that. So we have to use at least four months. Then only we can go for a uh, crow cast. That is, uh, that is the charcoal released and orthotic broker. This is the crow cast. Once the inflammation, the initial acute stage is settled, we can go for a crow walker. So what are the failures, risk factors uh, for failure of this total contact cost? 
large ulcers, large long duration. If the ulcer is more than two centimeter, and if it's a long duration, more than two months, it's very infect uh, uh, long ulcer. And Wagner classification is grade three or above. I said that grade three is almost as if the osteomyelitis. So I don't think so. Total contact is a solution for that stage ulcer. And uh, then sometimes it's a severe deformities. We can't apply the car, so that sort of situation. It could be a uh, yeah, total contact cars would be uh, would fail. Absolute contraindication is a, a infection, and relative contraindications are patients unable to tolerate the cars and patient unable to comply with the cars. Can marginal artery supply is affected that area. So those things are relative contraindications. So these things would be questioned in your NCQ paper. So those are the basically ulcer management. So when you go to the food, deformed food, the mainly I will concentrate about charcoal food. It's, we can do acute stage and the chronic stage. The acute stage is swollen, warm, and erythema. Chronic stage is become Structurally deformed, bony prominence, rock bottom foot, and here you can see so many deformed, uh, sorry, collapsing medial arc and ligament instability, so many things. Here I want to emphasize here in the acute stage, it's very important you to differentiate this charcoal foot from sepsis infection. I think uh, differentiate from uh, gouty arthritis and cellulitis those things. So basically important to exclude infection. The vital thing this commonly asked once we elevation, once we elevate the foot, leg, so it, if it is an infection, that erythema would not settle. But once we elevate, if it is a charcoal foot, that erythema will settle. So that is the main uh, clinical differentiating point you need to know in your exam because they would ask why your table, okay, how do you differentiate from acute infection from charcoal food? You have to tell about food elevation. What is the different finding? Then deformity assessment, uh, you need to know what is the pathophysiology. It could be a neurotraumatic. There are there is no clear cut theory, but there are three theories. They explain neurotraumatic theory, neurovascular theory, and the inflammatory theory. This neurotraumatic theory is a sensory motor neuropathy. What happens? This atrophy of the intrinsic muscles and imbalance between the intrinsic and extrinsic and flexors and extrinsic, they form deform. Neurovascular is uh, due to autonomic neuropathy. What happened? Uh, it leads to hyperemic state. It leads to hyperemic state and with vasodilatation and AV shunting, creating a very bony destruction and the synthesis. That leads to osteopenia and consequently they get fractures and consequently they get arthrodesis, uh, fusions of the bone, so many things happen as a sequel of neurovascular. Very recent theory they introduced that inflammatory theory is associated with the human ectotic factor and interleukin 6. This inflammatory theory they commonly ask in your exam by your table because it's very recently introduced. Because everybody knows about this neurotraumatic and neurovascular theory, but they will commonly ask about inflammatory theory and what are the two things involved in this human ectotic factor and the interleukin 6. You need to know about that. Read about it more detail. So these are the uh, clinical appearance of the foot and this X-ray appearance. You can see the bone subluxations, overgrowth of bones, fusions, deformities, subluxations, so many deformed. And you can see the collapsing and the uh, bulging now, uh, me, uh, mid foot is uh, protruding. That's a rock bottom uh, deformity. So there's a staging system you need to know, a modi uh, modified can hall staging system. So stage one, so I will not going to read that. It's a pre-segmented stage that initially that food is normal, x-ray wise, there is no x-ray deformities we can see, but we can see it's swollen, warm, erythema, it's like acute inflammation. 
but come to the stage one only we can see the fragmentation start extra changes osteopenia and the fragmentation joint subluxation then stage 3 is a repetitive stage it edema warm gradually decrease pain subside but start fusions of the fragment bone part and the last stage is a remodeling stage there is no inflammation very stable but deformed foot develops and we can see excess osteophytes subchondral sclerosis and multiple ankylos joint so the aim of management again you can start like multidisciplinary approach and diabetic control but here i will mention aim is to stop inflammation that is very important in the acute stage so i showed that shock or push start with the acute it's inflammatory phase so we need to control that stop inflammation that is the stage we need to use the total contact car until get the uh, settle this uh, inflammation so and we have to protect and maintain the Arch architecture of the foot to prevent deformation and pain because initial stage is painful. We have to use the pain management, and uh, we have to if there is a significant uh, bony prominence and excess soles like is threatening to the soft tissues, then we have to think about osteotomies or sometimes very unstable foot and subluxed joints. So we have to go for arthrodesis. so principles here is a diabetic control as i said you before and education the patient accommodative food prayer and the preventive measures and if there is a uh, ag aggressively we can acute state we can treat with the total contact cost and we should avoid this is very important thing we should avoid any surgical procedure in acute state because it's very evidence show evidence is showed that a high chance of infection so because of that as orthopedic surgeon you should not touch now if in your exam that shows all features of acute stage and very deformed foot and if they ask what are the surgical procedures if you mention about surgical procedures and you might not pass the exam because they will check whether you are very alert about acute stage then once it settle in scones or uh, or uh, uh, chronic stage only we can think about surgical procedures we can go for arthrodesis or fixation usually arthrodesis preferred over fixation and equanimous correction we can do soft tissue correction and i told about the total contact cast initially we had to use initial stage about 4 months once it turned into the symptom if it settle then we have to think about surgical correction or otherwise we can go ahead with the other food wears modified food wears if we fail conservative management only we have to think about surgical management principle here we have to fix the dislocation stabilize the fracture or dislocation if there is a bony prominence which is threatening to the soft tissue envelope then we have to excise that part you have to offload if there is a offload in the forefoot that we can do offload the forefoot by lengthening procedure of the Achilles tendon so it can as correction so that's the one procedure and last is the arthrodesis or osteotomy to the regional realignment deformity and the maintain the foot architecture so options is a is a stable foot we can assess the subtalar and the ankle joint and the forefoot mid foot joint and the forefoot joint if it's quite stable then we can do only for exhaust uh, exhaust tectomy excise the bone prominence and if it's quite unstable there's no point of uh, uh, excising uh, bony prominence because when this patient is walking very unstable foot anyway it's a danger to his uh, foot or life so then we can suggest arthrodesis with the internal fixation and if it is a unstable foot with the infected or large ulcer so it's not wise enough to go and put the implant inside the foot inside the body then you can go for a external fixation so that is a basic so i will touch at the last slide this nice guideline for the diabetic foot because i thought as a completion you need to know a little bit about nice guideline so it's all what i discussed before nothing new 
but I want to emphasize a couple of steps and the sim band classification here. That's all I want to emphasize is an ID guideline for the diabetic food. So I'll start with that. The first step is the multidisciplinary team approach. And we have to name a consultant as an endocrinologist as the main consultant, then the, the multidisciplinary approach and the local protocol for the prevention and assessment. It's a community-based protocol is there. So in the UK, so wherever the past, they have different, different protocols. You just have to mention that you can, you know, there should be a local protocol. That is a word you need to mention. Then they, they will understand you have some idea about the right guideline. Then if there's a, you need to know that in the, we assess the patient community-based, but you need to know what are the emergencies and life-threatening condition. We need to uh, refer them immediately to, to the MDT service. So if there's ulcers with the signs of infection, we are sepsis, so you need to immediately uh, direct them from community to the hospital base for the ulcer care. And then ulcers with limb ischemia and uh, clinical concern with deeply seated soft tissues and the osteomyelitis and gangrene, those are the urgent uh, situation we need to refer uh, according to the guideline. Nice guide. Then also assessment with the thin band classification or unicity access classification. But they specifically do not use Wagner classification in the NICE guideline. So they give the priority for the thin band classification. You see the, what is thin band classification? It's uh, that, that letters come thin is side, then I is chemia, and neuropathy, B bacterial infection, A area, D is the depth. So they will give the marks like this in the total score is six. So according to that, they will be classified. And you just, you don't have to know in detail about what is the score and this stage, what we do, this stage, this score, what we, you don't have to go that in there, but you need to know the thin band classification because they talk, of that nice guideline talk about it. And the treatment of uncomplicated ulcers, I already mentioned offload in control, infection, ischemia, debridement, drosin and all, and the diabetic foot infection. So that's all you need to know about diabetic food, I believe, in FRC. Thank you, Ajit, once again, for a very focused lecture for the FRC's exam. Uh, you have covered almost the entire section on diabetic foot and char charcoal. Uh, just a couple of questions. One is, uh, suppose you find an abscess, okay? Yeah. So whenever you make a statement that uh, there's no need for any surgical procedure, and if you actually find an abscess, because abscess in a diabetic foot has a, I believe it has a unusual uh, power to go to see through the soft tissues and cause further ischemia to the forefoot. So what is your take on that? Absolutely, it's urgent surgery. Because abscess is a Wagner tree. So it's a Wagner tree. It's a, it's a, that according to the NICE guideline also, it shows that clearly it's a alteration signs of sepsis. So, and clinical concern, deep serious soft tissue or bony infection, that's an urgent referral and it needs urgent uh, debridement. And uh, basically we'll treat it as an infected ulcer and debridement, microbiologist input, and foot care, yes, it needs urgent deprivation. But I especially men mentioned the acute stage of this deformed food. We don't do anything unless if the ulcers are not infected, then we can wait until the septic is infected. We can go for a conservative, we are total contact cause. Otherwise, if there's abscess, that's a clear indication for urgent, uh, early intervention, urgent intervention. Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, you've covered the entire uh, section and there are no more questions. People are very convinced and happy with your lecture. And uh, thank you once again, uh, Ajit, for joining no us. This is the fourth lecture, isn't it, with us? Fourth or fifth? Fourth, fourth. Fourth, okay. And, yeah, and I think we should uh, join again soon and because, you, I mean, this lecture is purely catered to the FRCS candidate. Thank you once again, uh, Ajit, and uh, no problem. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you.